This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers, on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions of software engineering topics at least once a month. SE Radio is brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine, online at computer.org slash software. Francis Perry is a tech lead and manager for Google Cloud Dataflow, a unified batch and streaming programming model. She was previously a developer on the Flume Project, an internal data processing infrastructure, and she is a co-author of the Google Dataflow paper. Francis, welcome to Software Engineering Radio. Thank you. Looking forward to chatting. Absolutely. So what is Stream? Ah, so stream processing is basically a style of data processing where you're continually processing data as it's, co- it's coming in live and you're producing live results continuously. A year ago, I was doing several shows about streaming frameworks and streaming systems, and I continually asked the question, what is the difference between batch and streaming? And I think different people have different answers to that question. What is your response to that question? So I think I want to take that even one step further. I think that's the wrong question to be asking. So in the way we want, we encourage people to think about data processing is that you're really, when you, you want to separate it into the shapes of your data and then how you choose to execute it. So in that sense, we're encouraging folks to use the terms bounded and unbounded when they refer to their data. So that's talking about whether if your data is bounded, you have it all right now. You can just you know, grab some file pattern off some file system and there's the data that you want to process. If your data is unbounded, it's continually streaming in. Now, given those two things, there are multiple ways in which you could choose to execute that data. There's the traditional batch style systems that everyone's familiar with, like Hadoop, MapReduce, that style. And then there's the, the more real-time systems that people are familiar with. But I, think, I don't think of those as two different axes. I think of it as a spectrum because there's actually a a really big continuum between sort of processing all your data at once, processing it continually in small records, and then in the middle, there's the style that people call incremental batch sometimes, or or micro-batch streaming, where you're processing small subsets of the data at a time, sort of like a cron job over little, little batch jobs. So you're talking about this unbounded data. In streaming systems, the data is often unbounded. It never stops coming. From the point of view of the server, you're just getting infinite data. How does handling unbounded data streams differ from handling a finite data stream? So I think the the thing that makes it really tricky and the place where it gets really fun is when we start looking into the distinction between event time and processing time. Um, so event time is the time the data was actually generated, when, when the event happened. And processing time is when it arrives in the system for, for processing. Now, to really understand that, I think it's really helpful to use a, an example. I didn't, I didn't grok this myself till I had a good concrete use case. Um, so let's imagine we are building a mobile gaming app or something. So, right, so we've got users on their mobile phones around the world playing some sort of game, doing some sort of mind-numbing task over and over again, earning points. Right? They're crushing candy or slaying zombies or something. Now those users are earning points for their team, and we want to be able to process that data and figure out what the team scores are over time. So if you look at that, when the user is processing, when playing the game, and they... Uh, they crush the candy and they earn some points. That's the event time, right? The time, the time when the score happened. Um, the processing time, though, is when that arrives in our system. So if they're online and nothing's wrong, wonky in the network, the data will actually arrive for processing very quickly. But there's many reasons that that can slow down. So perhaps there's a bit of network congestion or something, and some of the elements arrive out of order in our system. So we're getting some elements from some users slightly delayed. And even more commonly in mobile gaming, though, we want these games to be working in offline mode, which means that the users playing this game, you know, uh, in seat 26B on an airplane flight in off in airplane mode, and they land eight hours later, and that's when we get the score. So in this point, our system is processing data. Some of it's fresh and happening right now, and some of it might actually be eight hours old, and it's all coming in at the same time. And so that distinction between when the data happened and when it arrives makes streaming systems and real-time systems quite complex. 
The gaming example is interesting because gaming is this, uh, you, know, you could think of it as just a, uh, you know, not a serious application, but it's it seems paradigmatically similar to the types of applications we might be building in the future because there is such a large influx of data. Um, would you say that's accurate? Are our applications going to become increasingly data intensive and more quote unquote real time? Absolutely. I think, you know, people have really started to figure out what kinds of insights you can gather from data. And so the data itself is people are gathering more and more because they see how valuable it can be. And at the same time, we're doing so many more things in a distributed fashion, right? When you're, you're not just dealing with a couple of servers gathering data, you've got people on mobile devices and everything becomes much more distributed. And when you're dealing with distributed systems, you have to be able to deal with the uncertainties that come with that. So one uncertainty that you have been talking about is event time skew. Can you define that in more detail? Right. So the event time skew is, is basically the difference for an element in when it happens and when it arrives in the system. And so when you're dealing with, with uh, large amounts of data, there's sort of the, the skew that you're generally seeing, and then some elements may be even worse than that. So I think... It, another way of putting it, event time skew is the difference between the processing time and the actual event time. Would you say that's accurate? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So how significant of a problem is this event time skew? I think it really depends on your application. So for many things, you know, if, well, for many situations, you're absolutely fine dealing with processing time if that's enough for the algorithm that you're trying to process your data with. In other cases, if you're trying to talk about events and, and in relation to the other events that happened at the same time, event time skew is really going to mess you up. So let's say we are trying to calculate the total score for one of our teams in a particular hour, right? We've calculated that result. And if we're doing a streaming system, you know, presumably late, low latency is important to us. We want to be able to get you these results in near time, near real time. So maybe we've got a, a dashboard and we're trying to show, you know, which teams are currently at the top of the ranking. And if we go ahead and sum the scores from 12 to 1 o'clock, um, and we, we give you that result, and then eight hours later, one of those team members lands, and their, fl their flight lands, they come back online, and we get more scores. It's now 8 p.m., and we need to figure out how to go back and deal with the fact that the data that we generated at 1 p.m. was wrong, because we've got additional updates that came in, and we'd like to refine that result. Okay, I want to spend more time talking about the event time skew and how we deal with that, but I'd like to take a step back and talk a little bit more about streaming systems in general and historically, particularly for the listeners who are a little unfamiliar with streaming systems. So streaming systems are sometimes associated with this idea that you get incomplete or approximate results because there is this giant influx of data why has has there historically been a notion that streaming systems give these incomplete or approximate answers? I think because it is so difficult to deal with these late arriving elements and to, to reason about them in a way that, that makes sense, uh, people have just kind of thrown up their hands and said, you know what, we'll just assume that when those late elements come in after some threshold, we'll, we'll just ignore them. So I know that my system is going to be slightly lossy, but it's still great to get low latency. And so that's a trade-off I'm willing to make. Um, what we want people to start thinking about, though, is that that, that trade-off isn't necessary. With the right abstractions and, and ways of reasoning about these complex systems, we can actually get both correctness and still be able to handle uh, late arriving data. And one of the band-aids that people have used sometimes is this Lambda architecture, which uses batch to provide eventually correct results that can complement that streaming inconsistency. Why, why has this been a, uh, a, a thing that people have used? Why are people using batch to complement their streaming inconsistency? So I think, yeah, when your streaming runtime isn't able to give you guaranteed correct results, um, what the trade-off you're often willing to make is that every night I'll run a batch job to get my correct results, and during the day, because I'd like just to see some something more real-time, I'll be okay with approximate results, and then basically I'll throw those away at the end of the day and rerun my batch program to get the correct updates. And so a system like that works, 
but I, we think it can be unnecessary, right? And it's also much more difficult to, to manage because you're dealing, you have to manage both the streaming and a batch system, often you end up having to write your computation in two different ways with two different APIs and two different sets of concepts. Um, and I think that's unnecessary. Okay. So um, why why is it unnecessary? Why isn't the Lambda architecture good enough? Like, how can we roll this the functionality of both a, a batch and a streaming system into one? So I think there what it comes down to is when you have the right set of abstractions and uh, concepts for reasoning about these types of programs, you can reason, you can do both in one. So it's it, there's just no need to do them separately. Um, and so that's basically what's at the root of what used to be called the data flow model. So the data flow model is something that evolved out of a lot of work internally at Google. We actually had a very similar setup to the Lambda architecture for a while, where we had uh, MapReduce, obviously, which we'd used for, for many, many years, and we evolved that uh, into a system called Flume, which basically put a higher level uh, graph style API on top of MapReduce to make it much easier to, to program. And then separately, uh, we evolved some real-time systems. Millwheel uh, was our continuous real-time processing system. And what we found is that so many teams inside Google had both. They had their MapReduce job, they were running nightly for those correct results, and then they were also running a Millwheel system for more real-time results. But you know, Millwheel itself can actually do a really good job of not losing data. It, it started to develop those right concepts that let us realize that we could have actually correct streaming results. And when we realized that, we started to merge the two systems and see, see if we could, you know, make it so that people didn't have to do both. They could do one system and, and then tune after they wrote their algorithm, what is the latency requirement that I need in this particular use case? It's interesting that the Lambda architecture was essentially in place at Google uh, at the same time that people were talking about it outside of Google. Like, I think the discussions around it originated from Nathan Martz, who I don't think ever worked at Google, um, but I guess it's it's funny how these things develop in parallel at different places. Exactly. I mean, I think engineers, they, they see the problem and they all, you know, everyone was trying to solve the same things. Um, you know, internally, we, we did a huge amount to, to innovate in how we did big data processing, but we were sort of heads down and doing it in our very internal homogeneous environment. Um, and obviously the external community took, you know, the MapReduce paper and a number of other ideas and ran with that too. And it's, it's great to see they ended up going in similar directions. So I think one way to articulate why the Lambda architecture is probably not the best sustainable solution is that it has this assumption baked in that we can look at our data in a periodic fashion. We could just think of these daily jobs that resolve our data as an okay thing. But one quote from the data flow paper that I think counters this is, we as a field must stop trying to groom unbounded data sets into finite pools of information that eventually become complete. And instead, we must live and breathe under the assumption that we will never know if or when we have seen all of our data. Can you explain this quote in more detail? Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the things we want people to start thinking about is that even your traditional notion of, of batch processing and bounded data is actually often streaming data or in unbounded data. So, you know, when you have your log files and you're taking your logs from Tuesday and running a nightly cron job on them, and then the logs from Wednesday and you're running a nightly cron job, people think of that as, you know, batch processing. But really what they've done is they've taken an infinite stream of data and forced it into these finite chunks. They've artificially sort of divided it into finite pieces so that you can then uh, process it with a batch system. And there's actually a number of drawbacks to that. Um, so for example, um, if you're processing, you know, you're dealing with the latency of the batch system. So if you're trying to calculate the top users per hour, right, you've got by 1 a.m., you may have most of the data needed to do that for that hour. But if your nightly batch job isn't going to run till midnight of that day, you're waiting 23 unnecessary hours for that data, 
Another issue is that by artificially putting in these boundaries between the days to separate your, your infinite unbounded data into finite chunks, you may lose the ability to, to analyze certain portions of your data. So there's a, a concept called a session, which is a very common way that people analyze web logs and so on. And a session basically gathers up a burst of user activity. So this is like if somebody was playing our mobile game and they were playing, playing, playing for you know 20 minutes, and then they went to get a cup of coffee and chat with someone, and then they came back and played for another few minutes. We might want to treat that as two different user sessions or activities. And usually when you try to analyze those, you're, you're separating them by the time the user was offline between the activities. But when we force our data into these fixed chunks, we lose the ability to track sessions that cross that boundary. So for example, a user starts playing our game at 11.55 to 1 a.m., we might lose the fact that that was a single session if we process it the first day's uh, data completely separately from the second day's data. Hmm. So the data flow paper also talks about how the programmer is always making trade-offs between correctness and latency and cost when you are programming against an unbounded data flow. Could you explain how these three desirable characteristics are typically traded off? Right. So completeness is exactly that notion of how to deal with late data. So if I want to give you the total score for, for the teams in this hour, if I do it right when that hour ends, I may risk completeness, uh, lack of completeness, because there might be late data that comes in after that point. So. That's a trade-off I can make. If I want to be completely sure that I have gotten all the data for in that time period, I could wait. Maybe an hour is enough, maybe two, maybe a week, right? At some point, you sort of there's you have to figure out how long you want to wait to ensure completeness, and you can see how that immediately uh, counteracts latency, right? Because the longer I'm waiting to get completeness, the longer I have to wait for any sort of result. And often, that's, that's not what you want. You want sort of speculative results. So far, I know there's this score. And then you want to evolve that result and refine it over time as additional uh, work comes in. And then, of course, both of those, there's going to be a cost aspect because the more data you're buffering, the more often you're computing it, you know, the more computing resources you need to put behind that. OK. And so I, I want to come back to talking about the um, the dealing with the event time skew. Uh, you talked about sessions. Um, there's also this concept of windowing, where windowing is the concept of partitioning our data set along temporal boundaries. Is sessioning a version of windowing? Yes, absolutely. So let me separate that into, into two pieces. There's actually two, again, we, we always want to think about having these two time dimensions, right? There's event time and there's processing time. So the notion of windowing in the data flow model divides your data up into finite uh, chunks of event time. So you, there's multiple ways to do that. Uh, fixed windows are sort of the most common. So every hour's worth of data, every minute's worth of data. And again, this isn't when the data arrives. This is when the data occurred. And um, there's sliding windows. So every, uh, 20, every hour, give me the last 24 hours worth of data. And then sessions is, you know, give me sort of uh, bursts of user activity. The other dimension that you might want to divide things up on is uh, processing time. And there's a, a separate notion called triggering that we use to, to divide up processing time. OK, and as we're talking about these different windowing strategies, these strike me as things that were around even in the streaming systems that uh, acknowledged that we were getting some inconsistencies, these streaming systems that were complemented with batch in order to have the Lambda architecture. Um, how can we move towards a conversation where we talk about how windowing is used in order to make our streaming systems have a higher degree of correctness? Well, I think people have used the notion of windowing for a very long time, but what's been a more recent shift is this distinction between event time and processing time. So often when people used windowing in the past, they were sort of just referring to when my data arrived, so more processing time-based windows. Um, but we've really seen a shift recently in, in streaming systems towards recognizing that this distinction uh, is, is important. I see. Can you give an example for how we might use windowing to 
improve the resolution of our data in that type of gaming application? Right. So I think like in that in that gaming application, um, what you need to do is figure out, you know, first of all, what are the kinds of results that you'd like? So there's multiple ways we could choose to accumulate. So th there's two basic types of, of processing that you want to do. The first in the style of system is more element wise processing. So that's something like filtering or parsing or um, normalizing data, something that requires you only to look at a single element. We're very used to that in MapReduce. That's your, your map function, right? You're just taking individual elements and processing them. Doing that in a streaming system is pretty easy. You just need to be able to scale to handle the data volumes, and then you just apply uh, this function to each element as it goes past. It's the aggregations that get more complicated, and this is where you're looking at multiple elements at a time, so the count of all scores for this team. Right? You need to take all these individual scores that have the same team and, and sum them together. When you're doing that, these aggregations, this is where you need some notion of dividing your data up so you can make progress. The question, you know, what is the total score for this team over all time doesn't make sense because you're not going to ever actually get to the point where you have that result. So windowing is a way to let you start doing those aggregations. Okay. Can we talk about watermarks and what watermarks do for our streaming systems? Absolutely. So when we get, this goes back to that event time skew, right? So when you are trying to process data in fixed windows, so I want to process the data that happened in every hour. So I want all the data, all the scores that happened in between noon and one o'clock, and I'm, I'm going to sum those together. Now you immediately have to decide when can I do that sum? Right? So at one o'clock, I could sum it, but I probably won't have all the data if I'm assuming my data can arrive out of order. So when do I know that it's good enough? Should I go at 1.15, 1 1.30, 3 o'clock? Right? You have to pick that point when you think you've seen all the data. So the watermark helps you track that. Conceptually, a perfect watermark would let you know exactly when you've seen all the data for a given time. So you know, at this point, you will see no more data that happened between 12 and 1 o'clock, is what the watermark would tell you. Now, a perfect watermark is very, very unlikely. Um, there are some systems that could support it. Uh, so, for example, if you've got an append-only log file, right, you, you do know, and you're, you're time stamping elements based on when they get appended into that log file, you are able to read those in order. Um, but whenever you're dealing with a distributed system, you have to more likely use a heuristic watermark, which is your, the system's best guess of data completeness. So the system will sort of track how data is flowing into the system and give its best guess that, yes, now I think I've seen all the data from 12 to 1 o'clock. So maybe that happens at 110. And at this point, your system says, great, I can go ahead and sum those results and give you that, that output. Okay, so a, a definition of a watermark it might be that a watermark lets us track how completely we have processed our event data with respect to event times. So yep. a watermark with a value of time X indicates that all input data with event times less than X have already been observed. So exactly. Could you talk a little more about what the advantages of using watermarks are? Well, watermarks lets you very, very carefully track this distinction between event and processing time, right? Without it, you have to just make a call like, I'm going to wait two hours, and, and then I will go ahead and sum that, that score for that fixed window that I want and, and reproduce it. And when you do that, you are not going to be able to adapt if the data becomes really late. Maybe there's a fiber cut across the Atlantic and a whole bunch of stuff slows down, right? You, you'll still just go ahead and too eagerly uh, sum stuff and send the result down the pipe. On the other hand, you also may have to be too conservative a lot of the time, and you're introducing this unnecessary latency. So it, it basically forces you to, without the watermark, you sort of have to pick a time where you're going to throw up your hands and just move on. What is a trigger? So a trigger is sort of the opposite of a window in that it applies to uh, processing time. So right now we've been talking, there are some times when the event time isn't necessarily what you want. You just want to, if I'm just calculating a global uh, score for each team, it doesn't really matter to me when the elements happened. I can just say every 10 minutes of processing time, take whatever data I've gotten and sum it up and go ahead and, and emit that result. So triggering basically is that other axis. Um, and it can also interact with event time 
because I might want to say I'm summing scores every day. I want to use the event time and, and get a fixed window, daily fixed windows. And so that would basically say every 20, you know, once I've seen all the data for Tuesday and the watermark has passed and I think I'm done getting data for Tuesday, I'm going to omit that result. But if I do that, I've got very low latency. So I can also use a trigger to say every hour, I'd like an update of how that sum for Tuesday is progressing. Can you talk a little more about the the architecture for how these events are being placed from the client to the server? So for example, is it like the client is constantly streaming off events from the game or from the, an Uber application or some other real-time application with unbounded data, and the server is just aggregating all of these events in a queue and deciding when to process those events based on windowing and or just give me a, a better picture of how that architecture looks like and how the server is determining where these windows are being processed or where these windows are being imposed upon. Right. So the watermark is actually a per source uh, concept. So each input source defines its own definition of a watermark and how you can track what's going on with that source. So the system will be asking each of the individual sources about their watermark and then using that to calculate a global system watermark. So we do want to try to separate here very much what we call the data flow or beam model concepts, which is generally how you want to describe this data from the particular system details. At some point, we should talk a little bit more about Apache Beam and, and the distinction between that and data flow, and I can go into details on that then. Absolutely. We should, we should talk about that now. So, so we've been talking about streaming in a somewhat general context, but what we are really talking about is the data flow model of streaming. So can you explain how this data flow model that we've been discussing, how does that contrast with the other streaming models that were prominent before data flow? Right, well, I think it comes down to the, the fact that the, the data flow model is what evolved out of this internal work at Google that sort of took MapReduce and then Flume and Millwheel and all these systems and designed this, this one that unified batch and streaming use cases into a single model. So this is where we realize that if we can come up with the right set of concepts for letting you reason about this style of programming, you won't have to do it differently for streaming and batch. And so the data flow model really focuses on, the, on that unification. And it works based on uh, four main questions. So the first one is you talk about what you're computing. What is the algorithm you're doing? Are you doing joins, histograms, counts, sums, that kind of thing? Uh, the second axis is where, which uh, is our shorthand for where and event time. What do you want to do about the event time of the data? Does it come from uh, fixed windows, hourly windows, sliding windows? Uh, the next one is, uh, sorry, what, where, when. When is in processing time. So how often do you want to trigger your results? And then finally, how. What do you want to do when multiple results are emitted for a window? When we refine an, a result over time, should those accumulate and how should those relate? So what we've really done is taken all these concepts and put them into a very clear framework that lets you really clearly tune each of those concepts. So you can build your same data processing algorithm that you want to do. And then by that's your what, right? The bulk of what you're doing is, is the what question. What am I trying to compute over my data? And then you tune the other three questions to basically adapt that algorithm, that single algorithm, from a traditional batch style use where you've got all your data, you just want to process it and get a single result out, into a more continuous real-time data, uh, data where you have to start tuning how often and how complete you want your results to be. So with that said, with the data flow model defined, what is Apache Beam? Ah, so this is a lot of fun, right? So we took... We worked on, on, on Dataflow. It came out you know, based on this internal evolution of, of work we'd been doing. And we also uh, created the Cloud Dataflow, Google Cloud Dataflow, which is part of Google Cloud Platform. And it is a system for executing these pipelines. So you can sort of, there's two separate concepts here, right? There's the programming model, which is the, the SDKs and the APIs that let you express your data processing pipelines. And then there's the service for actually executing those pipelines. So you know, what happened when we designed this is that the model itself is a key way to use the service. The model is what 
gives you these really intuitive ways for writing these pipelines, the right you know, tools for reasoning about event and processing time. And it also has the right uh, hooks so that the system can very efficiently execute these things. But by designing a new SDK and a new programming model, you really make it hard for users to adapt and take over and start using a system, right? Because there's a huge barrier for users to rewrite their programs, to learn these concepts and to invest in that. Um, so what we, we realize is that this programming model itself has, has a huge amount of value. And if we contributed that to the open source community, we could let that model grow and, and flourish. And at the same time, we could have a, one of these systems and the places to run that. So what we did is take that data flow model basically and donate it to the Apache Software Foundation. So it's currently uh, in incubation as the incubating project Apache Beam. And so Beam is now what we used to call sort of the data flow model. Um, and what we're really excited about is we're working with the community to build different runtime options. So you can take this Beam program and you can run it on Cloud Dataflow, but you can also run it on other existing uh, systems. So you can run Beam pipelines on Apache Spark. You can run them on Apache Flink. Uh, we've got some, in, we've just had a gear pump uh, runner added. We've got interest in Apex and Storm and other systems. So is writing a program that is b compliant with the Beam spec, is that kind of like writing a program in one specific language that can be put through an interpreter to a variety of other languages? And then the, uh, the analogies to the language here would be these different processing systems like Flink or Spark? Exactly. So you think of it like, you know, what's in Beam is the description of your data. So that's where we use the terms bounded and unbounded, right? You're talking about purely the properties of your data and how you'd like to process it. So this is, this is your API for expressing that. And then when you're ready to run that, you choose sort of what you want to compile it into. Do you want to, you know, have it translated into Spark concepts and execute it on Spark? Do you want to translate it into Flink, run it there, um, or so on? So let's go through an example with that game. So if we were developing a, uh, we wanted to, to use the Beam model on our game, what kinds of abstractions do we need to define uh, across the events of our game? Right, so let's start with answering the what question. So the what question, we're just going to do sim simple uh, score summing, right? So we'll take our input data, we'll parse each element to extract the team and the number of points scored for that team, and then we'll do a sum to get the, number, the total score per team. So that's our what, that's the first question, right? And we could just sort of take that and run it in a traditional batch style over some large amount of input data. But now if we want to evolve that, we can start answering those other questions. So we can answer the where, the windowing, and we can take that same algorithm that we wrote, add one other, one or maybe two lines of code, depending on how long you like your lines, um, and say, and now do this in fixed windows. So every hour, give me a different sum. So at this point, we're starting to, to take that single algorithm and evolve it. Now we can go further and we can say, we can adapt it into a streaming pipeline by saying how often we want to, to trigger those results. So I'd like, I'd like hourly um, windows and I'd like to know how those are progressing every 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes give me an update on what my hourly windows look like. And why would it be useful to run this model on Storm versus Spark versus Flink versus Dataflow. Once we define it, once we define this unified programming model version of our streaming uh, feature of our application, why might we want to, you know, how would these different processing systems contrast in the way that they would actually execute that model? Right. Well, this this really becomes down to user choice, right? Some some folks like to run on premise. Some folks like to run in the cloud. Some folks like to use open source. Some folks want to be part of an integrated platform. So this is really where your your choice comes up. Just you know, it, the more choice users have for for where they're processing their data, um, the the better things are because they've got their data in different places. They've got different requirements. They want the freedom to move between those systems and not be locked in. So is it just about the lock-in, or are there certain types of operations that might run faster on Spark or might run faster on Dataflow? 
Yeah, absolutely. So what I mean, what we're trying to do here is generalize. There's sort of two things, right? We want to generalize how you reason about the style of programming into the most intuitive model we can. So that's that's the first step. We drive the beam model, the, you know, based purely on what makes sense for reasoning about the style of programming. Then we want to give you the portability of running that model across multiple environments. But each of those environments is a little bit different, right? Every every one of those systems has things it can and cannot do as well as the others, and so that's where. Um, we work really hard to categorize, you know, which features each of those runtimes will be able to support in the Beam model. What are the streaming systems that do conform to the Beam model? So the closest one right now with the, the cleanest alignment is Apache Flink. So um, I think, you know, there's there's definitely some information out there that the Flink guys were really excited to read the Dataflow model paper. And so they went off and they took some of those concepts and they integrated them deeply into Flink. So it's notion, Flink's notions of event time and processing time align beautifully uh, with, with the Beam model. Um, systems like Spark are, are sort of moving in the right direction. Spark 2.0 has a lot of new features that will really help align those, um, but it's still getting there in terms of adding watermarks and, and so on. The Flink team was enthusiastic about how well the Dataflow model provided a desirable way of modeling those data processing pipelines. How did Flink's data processing work prior to its implementation of the Beam model? You know, that's a great question and one I have the background to answer. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Do you have much knowledge on how they went about making their processing system Beam compliant? I mean, I think, you know, they we definitely had some early chats with them when the, the paper got out and then we ended up having some, you know, some hangouts to chat with them and talk about these concepts. And the, the thing I loved is that the, the Flink guys are wicked smart, right? They, they grok this stuff deeply. So we were really able to have these deep technical conversations with them, um, which was a lot of fun to see how they, they take, they, they ended up, you know, evolving in a similar direction and we were able to refine the two and, and really get them to align. So can, can you tell me what is involved in making a system beam compliant? Like, uh, you know, for example, what does Apache, what do both Apache Flink and Apache Spark have to implement in order to make their APIs Beam compliant? So I think, you know, the, the core concepts in Beam are things like element-wise processing, right? That's that's very standard since the MapReduce days. Most people, most systems can do that, that very easily. Um, then we've got, you know, the different styles of aggregation and windowing, and this is where systems start to diverge a little bit in their ability to support the Beam model. And, and some, some will be able to do that and some won't as much. So we've laid out on the Beam site a really nice uh, matrix of sort of all the concepts and what the current status is of support for each of these uh, different runners. Let's talk about that term more. What is a Beam pipeline runner? Yeah, so that's, you write your Beam pipeline, and we really, again, want that to be only about the shape of your data and your algorithms and your business logic. Then the Beam runner is the thing that takes that and actually executes it for you. Now, most Beam runners bec want to actually do this at scale, and they're, so what they do is they shell out to an existing system. So most runners will take that generalized Beam pipeline and translate it into the primitives used by a system like Spark or Flink and call out to that system for you. Um, we do have one runner that actually does the implementation. That's called the direct runner, uh, and that's just your simple sort of in-memory runner. So that one is is used great. It's great for testing, unit tests, and integra uh, integration tests, and development, and so on. But most of the runners that actually do this at scale are really wrappers around other distributed processing environments. So when I'm defining my Beam pipeline, what does that look like? Is there like a file format or a configuration style that I use that will work across all of the different Beam pipeline runners that have been implemented? So there's 
to answer that, I'd like to do the short term and the long term, right? So in the, <laughs> okay. in the short term, what you do to write a beam pipeline is use the Java SDK, which generates, you know, lets you say things like, I'm going to create a pipeline. I'm going to read from this type of data. I'm going to count it. I'm going to join it. I'm going to window it like this. I'm going to write it over there. Basically, what you're doing is writing a Java program that builds a, a DAG that describes the shape of your pipeline. And then from that, uh, that the representation of that DAG is what is then translated into each of the systems. So that's where we're at right now, where we're mainly Java-based, but our goal is to really support as many languages as you want, right? We've just actually gotten started on the Python SDK. It's now in a feature branch on Beam. But because when we use the term Beam programming model, we want to use that instead of SDK because the concepts in Beam are much more general, right? It's just which language you use to express those concepts is almost just an implementation detail. So where we'd like to get to is the part where we have a language independent representation of a Beam pipeline, which means we can have Beam SDKs in multiple languages that will go ahead and generate that graph description that describes the pipeline and the data shapes, and then the runners can pick that up and go ahead and run them. So that will make it very easy for, for users to choose the language that works best for whatever else they're doing and the runtime that works best. So there are plenty of companies that have a streaming system that is already in place at their company, whether it's Flink or Spark or Storm. Is one of the visions for Apache Beam to be this way to move forward with new streaming systems while maintaining back compatibility with your old streaming systems? I think, unfortunately, it's a little more complicated than that because you have to, to in order to use Beam, there is a step of rewriting your logic into Beam. So if you have a, a Flink cluster that you've got up and running and you're really comfortable with it, you're welcome to run Beam on that Flink cluster, but it is going to require some effort on your part to front load the work to use Beam, right? So it's, it's not as easy to transition from, you know, I've got a bunch of business logic in one system already. And that's, that's a real shame. I think that's part of you know, what makes this a, a hard project and where we really want to get the community involved and working to help folks understand why this model is an improvement over the previous ways that people have expressed programs. So what are the discussions with the community like and why is it important for Beam to be an Apache project? Well, Apache's, the Apache Software Foundation is where all the big data stuff is, right? Every, everything's there, Hadoop and Spark, uh, data formats like Parquet and Avro and, and Storm and Cassandra. So Flink, plenty of things are there. So it's the, absolutely the right group of data processing geeks <laughs> for us to join in with. And I think, you know, what we're really looking forward to is what happens when we try to generalize this model across all these different systems, right? We, we built... The, the initial beginnings of the Beam model obviously came out of Cloud Dataflow. So it was very much tied to how Cloud Dataflow chose to execute things. But when we generalize that and we see sort of the diversity of the way these different systems work, it really helps you to separate out what is properties of your data and your algorithm from what is properties of that specific runtime. So can can you help me understand a little bit more? I think I... I maybe kind of touched on this question a little bit, but what are the pervasive strengths and weaknesses of these different streaming systems? Like once we have this unified programming model that gives the top level description of how we are creating our, our, our data pipelines, how should we be evaluating which systems to run that data model on top of? So I think there it will come down to, you know, which features of, of Beam are really important for your use case. So I think as we've already talked about, some systems do a better job of distinguishing event time and processing time. I think that it's very clear that the, the streaming community as a whole is, is re moving in that direction and being able to distinguish those two, but some systems are, are slightly further along than others in their ability to do that. There's also dimensions like do you need your processing to be uh, at most once, uh, at least once, or exactly once? So there are systems that, that are able to, to work in real time and, and get data out fast by potentially you know, duplicating elements and double counting things or potentially losing elements. And for many applications, 
that's okay. If you just want rough, you know, rough heuristics about your data, that may be a trade-off you're totally willing to make, but other systems are going to be able to provide exactly one's guarantees, which, you know, that might be what you want if you're running a billing pipeline or something where money's involved. Right. So this exactly once processing, you could call this strong consistency. Why is this form of correctness often challenging in streaming systems? Well, you have to be able to hand off the data and sort of handshake with the next part of the system as the data goes through the pipeline. Right. You basically you're you're reading in an element, you're you're processing it, and you want to make sure that you don't act back to whoever you read it from until you have persisted it somewhere. Right? Because machines fail. It happens all the time. Things go offline, network connections go down. Like what is how are you going to make sure that failures don't cause data loss? That's really the trick. So is this like the equivalent of three phase commit in a database transaction? Right, something like that. And then as you're as you're tracking also, you know, reasoning about these different time dimensions and buffering things across windows and and things it you know, it it's pretty complicated to keep track of this across different stages in the pipeline. Tell me more about your work on cloud data flow. Cloud data flow is the Google hosted version of data flow. What is the cloud data flow project? Right. So cloud data flow is a part of Google cloud platform. Um, and it is exactly, you know, you can think of it as we sort of finish this transition towards Apache beam as being a fully managed service for executing beam pipelines. So in other words, you describe the shape of your data and then we'll deal with all the nastiness under the hood. You know, we'll provision the machines, spin them up, tear them down, scale the number of machines dynamically as you're executing, which is, is a huge deal, right? In a, in a batch pipeline, you often see that the amount of data uh, that you're processing changes throughout the life of the pipeline. You might start with a huge amount of data that you're filtering down to a very small amount of data, which then somehow expands to a really large amount of data. And th so through those different phases, you might want different numbers of machines. You don't want to be over-provisioning and paying for more machines than you need, or if you're under-provisioning, then you're going slower than you have to. So being able to dynamically adapt to that is a huge benefit. Is that to say that the streaming applications we're writing today, we have to write a lot of uh, management, like server management code that is maybe not going to have to be written on, on top of the future cloud platforms? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we really want to get into the, the mode where the system, it's a no-knobs experience. You don't have to tune the amount of RAM you're using, the number of machines you're using, how they're configured, right? You want to be focusing as an application developer, as a data processing person, on your data and your algorithms. You don't want to be futzing with the system that's, that's running that for you. So what does building that as an automated feature, what does that look like from your point of view? Well, I think it's a really interesting back and forth between the programming model and the service. So if you think about what makes these systems complicated is you're not just sort of giving them a couple of instructions and letting them go off and calculate something for you. You're giving them bits of your own serialized code to execute. So these systems, right, they're handling sort of getting the data from one place to another and running this stage and then that. They're doing that management, but the code that's executing, what you're doing to every element, how you're aggregating, all that's described by the user. Which means when you implement a system to do this, the system's almost dealing with all these little black boxes that are your user code. And so it's taking data and giving it to your user code and then taking it from that and giving it to something else. And what it doesn't know is how that user code's going to behave. So designing that makes it very difficult to, for example, parallelize. If I don't know how long your code is going to run, I don't know how many machines to, to do it, how to schedule it if I have no visibility into what it's going to do. So designing an SDK and a programming model that gives the system just the right hooks to be able to efficiently schedule and rebalance that work uh, is, is one of the, the really fun parts. So in order for this project to be uh, to reach the fruition that you want it to, do each of the popular streaming systems need to implement a Beam compliant model? So I think, you know, Beam is, we, we want enough to, right? I don't think everyone needs to. What, what we really want to set up with Apache Beam is at the core of it, it is just this programming model, the set of concepts, 
right? And then we want to set up a framework that allows someone who is a language developer, who has a passion for Ruby or R or Go or Visual Basic, whatever, to come along and help build out the SDK for that language in Beam, right? To let you build Beam pipelines in that language so that it feels native to people who, who live and breathe that language. At the same time, we want to allow people who have a runtime environment, uh, you know, they have some sort of distributed processing system to come and teach, uh, teach Beam how to run programs on that environment. So what that will really do is let the community decide which paths are the most exciting. I think as Beam, we, we see our, our, our job to set up this framework that allows these different things to flourish. And as to what paths become most, most popular and most well-loved and used, that'll depend on the user communities. So one of the increased expectations that we've had about our data processing that we've been discussing in this episode is the idea that you need improved fidelity on the difference between event time and processing time. What are the things that you think we're going to be focusing more on with regards to our data as time goes on? Maybe geospatial data or, I don't know, some other aspect of the shape of our data. What things do you think are going to be changing in the next five to ten years? Well, I think, yeah, so event time and processing time is a big one. And I think we're also really seeing, you know, folks starting to understand that, that streaming is a, is a runtime choice, right? What you're You want to separate out those data shapes from where you execute them and how you execute them. And by giving people that layer of portability, um, it, it will make things much better in the future for the way you, you write your programs without having to leak those underlying implementation details up into your user code. Okay. So how can people get started with Dataflow or with Google's cloud version of Dataflow? So if, if you want to come and run on Google Cloud Platform right now, you know, just come check us out at cloud.google.com. We've got getting started free trials. You can come, you can try out Dataflow, you can use that. So, you know, if, if that's what you're interested in, that is absolutely great. Come do that. I think also I want to put out a, a call to action for Apache Beam, right? Beam Beam is a community that is much more broad than Google. We've got folks from, from multiple companies, Google included, but also, you know, Data Artisans and Cloudera and PayPal and Talend, um, Intel, folks working on making that programming model really the most generalized, uh, efficient, unified model that we can build. And so there, we're really trying to kickstart that development community. Um, so, you know, you can come to beam.incubator.apache.org and, uh, you know, join the dev list, start listening to the discussions, um, read our contribution guide, grab a starter task, like really dive in and, and start helping contribute to that community. Great. And where can people find out more about you and your work? Oh, uh, I guess I'm on Twitter, Francis J. Perry. That's probably the main place, I guess. And read the read the cloud data uh, the data flow model paper from VLDB last year. Yes, that's an illuminating paper. And also, I would say some of the videos uh, on YouTube about data flow and event time processing. Yep. Uh, versus. Yeah. There's there's basically there's some videos and also there's a series of blog posts actually written by a coworker of mine Tyler Akado. Um, if you search for O'Reilly, uh, the world beyond batch streaming one one hundred one and streaming one hundred two, uh, he goes through a lot of these concepts and he's got these magic animating gifs that really show you sort of examples of of watermarks progressing through event time and processing time, and those magic animating gifs are really the best way to understand this. It's so hard to describe in words, but when you see it. Uh, starts to make a lot more sense. Right. You know, as I was preparing for this show, that was one of the things I was struggling with is how to articulate this discussion of the watermarks and the event time versus processing time. And I do think that probably the visual representations are the best places to look. So we'll we'll put the, those in the show notes. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, what, and real quick, was there anything that... You know, particularly from those the streaming 101 and streaming 102 presentations that Tyler put together was there anything about streaming that we didn't cover that you'd like to touch on 
You know, I think we hit the major points, right? We, that we want to start thinking about data shape and bounded and unbounded, separate from implementation details, and that by tuning these different axes of event time and processing time, we can we can really cover stuff. I think another thing we can't, we didn't really, we weren't able to show visually right now is the code that you write in the Beam model is so beautifully modular, right? The questions, the what, where, when, and how, they're literally line after, you know, four lines in a row. And it makes it so easy to, to build these modular pipelines where you can tune each of those independently. Um, so if you go and, and look, or look online, there's a, a blog post comparing sort of the the Dataflow Beam SDK to what it looks like to write similar programs in Spark, for example. And you can really see that these concepts become much more reusable and much more modular, and you don't have to sort of leak the implementation details into your user code. That's great. Okay, well, Francis, thanks a lot for coming on the show. I really enjoyed this conversation. Excellent. Thanks for chatting. Okay, great. Getting software to your users quickly and reliably is the most important part of being a software engineer. SnapCI's cloud-based continuous integration and continuous deployment tool lets you set up in minutes with your GitHub account, and within a few clicks we'll have your first pipeline running. Discover and fix your bugs quickly before pushing to production by setting up stages from simple ones to complex that run automatically when you push your changes. Need more speed? Run tests in parallel with expanded workers and get your feedback fast. Deploy to Heroku, AWS, and more. We even integrate with Slack to give you updates on your builds. Go to snap.ci slash software radio and build, test, and deploy free for 30 days. SnapCI embodies the lessons that ThoughtWorks has learned from 20 years of software deployment. The same lessons that have been written about by Martin Fowler and Jez Humble. Check it out at snap.ci slash software radio. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more information about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can write comments on each episode on the website or write a review on iTunes. Mention or message us on Twitter, at SE Radio, or search for the Software Engineering Radio Group on LinkedIn, Google+, or Facebook. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under the Creative Commons 2.5 license. Thanks again for your support.